All right, so plankton is a division of life in the ocean by lifestyle. We talked about the domains of life, which is kind of genetic relationships, and makes uh, a lot of, uh, has a lot of importance for determining how organisms live in the ocean, all multicellular organisms effectively, or eukaryotes, for instance. Um, but plankton is fundamentally a lifestyle. It's organisms that drift in seawater or maybe swim, but swim over small distances generally, perhaps a few hundred meters to get into the sunlight or into the dark part of the ocean to avoid being eaten or to find food or swimming around in circles looking for prey, for instance, um, but not swimming you know, across ocean basins. So for these organisms, where they are in the ocean is really a matter of where the ocean takes them for the most part, at least in, their, in terms of their horizontal position. They're drifting along with the gyre currents or whatever, whatever other currents are, uh, happen to be going on where they live. Uh, but they may be able to swim up and down, for instance. So it's a lifestyle. It's a drifting lifestyle. And many organisms have that type of lifestyle, mostly microscopic organisms, but certainly larger organisms like jellyfish, for instance, and drifting forms of seaweed. Okay, so most plankton are organisms that are barely visible with the eye or even invisible with the eye. In some cases, it's very difficult to see even in a microscope. And in the open ocean, once the water depth gets beyond about a couple hundred meters, sunlight no longer penetrates to the bottom, or at least not with enough intensity to support photosynthesis. And so for most of the ocean, the whole food web is basically dependent on planktonic organisms that live up in the sunlit part of the ocean and can do photosynthesis. So many of the things we think of as sort of large organisms in the ocean, fish, whales, and so on, ultimately depend on single-celled organisms. And the majority of these single-celled organisms, the majority of plankton, even when they're multicellular organisms, are small. Uh, so this is just a dramatic image, I guess, from a photo contest, actually, which I stole off the web mercilessly, and in this case, we're looking at a, the needle of a, sorry, the eye of a needle and a droplet with some zooplankton, including a little copepod there, I think. These are actually pretty big for plankton, but of course, they're easily able to fit through the eye of a needle. So understanding where, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> understanding what plankton are doing in the, in the ocean, what plankton are there, is a bit of a challenge, actually, technologically, um, just getting them out of the seawater, these very small organisms. And of course, the natural thing to do to trap organisms in the ocean so that you can study them is to do something like drag a net. And there are nets that are designed specifically to sample plankton. This is an example of a fairly small one, but gives you a nice human scale. Um, so here's the front end of the net, and there's a fine mesh here that extends backwards from the hoop. And then typically towards the back end, you can't see it terribly well here, but maybe you'll be able to see it in another image. There's usually a little cup that is where the plankton will tend to collect. If you drag this net through the ocean, often for quite a fair distance, actually, plankton tend to accumulate at the back of the net and are eventually collected and can be studied there. But of course, you can only catch organisms if they're uh, about as big as the holes in the net or larger. Right? A very tiny organism might just pass right through the holes in that net. So this method of sampling plankton is inherently incomplete. You're going to get bigger plankton, and of course you're going to get the more common plankton, but you may miss some of the smaller organisms. <coughs> Here's another picture of a plankton net, and in this case you can actually kind of see a little bit better the collector at the end. So this is where the plankton samples actually tend to accumulate. There's a little cup. So this issue of size is actually kind of important. Um, if we just look at the distribution of sizes of plankton and other organisms in the ocean or elsewhere, in a lake, for instance, it follows a trend that hopefully makes some sense, that there are phytoplankton, the primary producers, and then there are zooplankton, which live off of them or eat each other. And those organisms tend to be a little bit bigger because they have to eat the phytoplankton, so they tend to be larger than them, but not always. And then there are other single-celled organisms, bacteria, which may or may not be part of the phytoplankton community. And even viruses, of course, are present in the ocean, just like they're present on land. 
And when you get to smaller levels of phytoplankton, bacteria, and viruses, we're getting to particles that are smaller than perhaps a millionth of a meter in some cases. And it is very hard to make a net with a mesh size that's smaller than a millionth of a meter. In fact, a typical mesh size for a net is of order 100 millionths of a meter. That's a tenth of a millimeter. So we're still talking a very fine net. When you get pores that are as small as a micron, it's actually very hard to force water through them. If you were to drag a net through the water that had a pore size of one micron, one millionth of a meter, the water wouldn't actually go through it. It would just go around it, and it would just be a big anchor dragging the, the boat backwards. So specialized filters and forced water are actually necessary, or other things like centrifuges to actually study these smallest organisms. And the net result is actually we know rather a lot about some of the larger plankton in the ocean. And actually, we're still discovering some really important fundamental things about the smallest living organisms in the ocean. In fact, one of the really important things that's been done over the, only over the last 10 years or so is to go into the ocean and sample its genetic diversity by looking directly at DNA rather than try to collect whole organisms and study them that way. And of course, we're finding lots of things that we would never have found otherwise, simply because they belong to organisms that are too small to be caught in nets. So when I talk about phytoplankton and zooplankton, I'm going to focus in on a few types of organisms. And I'm trying to pick out the most important ones in terms of you know, these are the ones that are the most abundant. These are the ones that do the most photosynthesis. These are the ones that have kind of interesting behaviors associated with them. But I'm actually only giving you part of the story. There's actually this whole very small population of organisms, or this whole population of very small organisms in the ocean that actually isn't that well understood even today. So there are several thousand species of phytoplankton, and this number is increasing all the time. It's actually probably already quite a bit out of date, even though I've only, I think I only looked that up last year. Um, and it's an area of active discovery. And those of you who came to the extra credit movie after the second midterm, of course, one of the points of that movie is that when you get down below 1,000 meters or so in the ocean, pretty much every time somebody goes down there and just looks around, we find new species of large organisms. So hopefully it stands to reason that actually the smaller organisms that even take more effort to separate from water are being discovered at an even greater rate. Um, and we're going to talk, in particular, on the subject of phytoplankton about three groups. We're going to talk about diatoms, we're going to talk about dinoflagellates, and we're going to talk about coccolithophores. We're going to take them in turn. So diatoms, hopefully, rings a bell in your mind, because we've already talked about them a little bit. We talked about them in the context of marine sediments. They're one of the leading sources of siliceous oozes on the seafloor. They make scales out of, they make their sh uh, shells out of SiO2, out of silica, with some water bound in the structure as well. And these are autotrophic organisms. They're phytoplankton. Um, some of them aren't plankton. Some of them actually live in the bottom. So there are diatoms that are benthic, but we're going to focus in on planktonic ones today. And in terms of plankton, they're probably the most abundant group, again, that's large enough to be studied easily in the ocean. And uh, they're responsible for a lot of the photosynthesis, a lot of the primary productivity that happens in the ocean. However, even though they're really, really important in the ocean today, they're actually relatively recent arrivals on the scene. They evolved about the same time as the dinosaurs. Okay, So these are organisms that haven't been around in the ocean since time immemorial. In fact, they're relatively recent. They're more recent than mammals, I think. So mammals were around before diatoms were. Diatoms have a really prominent morphology, or at least their shells do. They kind of look like little pillboxes. And you can see it in a couple of these images in particular, that you have kind of two halves that are seen together. These, these are actually, I believe, two different diatom organisms. You can kind of see the seam going here. So kind of two halves of an SiO2-rich shell that kind of fit together, one on top of the other. That shell is transparent. It's rigid. Um, and the organism actually does most of its work inside of that shell. So the chlorophyll that it uses to do photosynthesis is actually protected inside of this SiO2 shell. Oh, I should say. 
that, of course, there are one of the most prominent features of these shells are these very tiny holes. It's kind of a lace, lace work almost. It's not like a solid shell. And there's still not, I would say, at least the last time I checked, full understanding of why they are shaped the way they are and what's so important about making a shell out of SiO2, which is pretty rare in seawater. It's a nutrient in seawater. It actually restricts the abundance of these things that SiO2 is so rare and they need it to make their shells as opposed to calcium carbonate, which is pretty abundant in the ocean. Um, one idea that used to be floating around, I don't know if it's still current, is in fact that that shell, in addition to protecting the organism to some extent and being nice and transparent, which maybe makes it harder to eat them or to find them to eat them, actually plays a role in converting between carbonate and CO2 inside their bodies, which one form of that molecule, carbonate or CO2, is actually more suitable, easier to do photosynthet photosynthetic work with. And so it actually functions as kind of a catalyst to help them do their photosynthesis. That's an idea that I think Francis Morel talks about, but I'm not sure if it's been generally accepted. Okay, so diatoms you can think of as being really photosynthesis engines. They are really, really good at harvesting sunlight and turning that sunlight into stored chemical energy into growing themselves on sunlight. And this, actually, you can see it just by looking at them under a microscope. We have four individual diatoms here, and these are kind of bowling pin-shaped ones, or rolling pin-shaped ones. And you can see they have these big sacs that hopefully are standing out a little bit as green. I tried to find a better picture, but this is one of the best I could find. Big chloroplasts, these big organs in their bodies that hold chlorophyll, and lots of chlorophyll. So they're really kind of optimized, apparently, to make the most of the sunlight they get. They can really take that sunlight, harvest it, and turn a lot of it into energy. Now, of course, we have our own uses for diatoms. They're made out of SiO2, which doesn't dissolve very quickly in water. It's kind of inert. It's actually very similar chemically to glass. You can think of their shells as being a form of natural glass almost. And they have these tiny little holes, which they use for their own purposes to get nutrients in and out and perhaps to help carbon dioxide and carbonate swap back and forth between ke different chemical forms to make it easier for them to do photosynthesis. But of course, those small holes are useful for us because we find accumulations of these organisms, including, in, by the way, Southern California. We have lots of deposits of diatomaceous earth, which is a geological deposit, a silicious ooze, very rich in diatoms. And all these tiny particles with tiny little holes in them make for very good filters. And in fact, we do lots of filtering using diatomaceous earth. The beer that you get from the supermarket, the reason it's not cloudy is because it's actually in many cases been pressed through a diatomaceous earth filter, essentially through the skeletons of these organisms and all the tiny holes in them. And many other things are actually purified much the same way. Diatoms are most common in the, they occur in lots of places, okay? And not even just in the ocean. There are freshwater diatoms as well. And they are typically found in areas where the water is a little bit colder. So they're really common in kind of polar waters. They're pretty common actually off the California coast. But of course, we're in the vicinity of an eastern boundary current, which is itself fairly cold because it's bringing water down from near the North Pole. And so these are really common sort of a little bit away from the equator not quite uh, in the warmest parts of the ocean. Diatoms effectively don't swim. The, they aren't really designed for that. Um, instead, in order to maintain their position in the photosynthetic part of the ocean, and you learned about this a little bit in your lab, I think, last week, um, they use several adaptations, actually, to keep themselves from sinking. So they're very small, and of course you've learned that small things don't sink very fast, particularly when they're mostly made out of water and so aren't very much denser than the water that's, that they're buoyant in. They actually, in many cases, form chains. It's very common to find diatoms living in essentially a colony stuck one, on, one next to the other on end, which also makes, it, makes them tend to sink more slowly. Um, they can control the saltiness of their bodies. Of course, salt makes water more dense. And if they control the internal components of their cells to exclude salt, that tends to make their insides a little bit less dense than the surrounding water, which adds buoyancy. And they can store oils in their bodies. And that actually serves a couple of purposes. Oil is generally less dense than water. 
so it tends to make anything that has the oil in it float. And also, oil is a really efficient way to store energy. Oil has lots of food energy in it. So an organism that has fatty deposits inside its cell is well suited to, for instance, make it through a period of time where it's not really very good for doing photosynthesis, for instance, when it gets cold or if it's cloudy or if for some reason they find themselves trapped below ice or some other situation in which there's not sunlight or nutrients necessary to make their living. Diatoms have a really interesting sex life um, in that they can reproduce either sexually or asexually. And this allows them to respond quite well to temporary availabilities of nutrients. Diatoms and another organism we'll talk about, actually both the other types of phytoplankton we talked about, can engage in blooms. Essentially, when the conditions are right in the surface of the ocean, there's sunlight and nutrients are available on the surface either because of upwelling or because you're near a continent and there's runoff in a river, for instance. They can take advantage of that suitability of the environment and reproduce very quickly, making lots and lots of organisms to use that nutrient availability up. And diatoms can do this by reproducing very quickly asexually, essentially by dividing themselves into two. And so if we look at a cross-section through one of those pillbox shells, so here we're kind of looking at a cross-section, and this would be the seam between the two halves of the pillbox. They can sort of pull the pillbox about apart and make a couple new extra half shells on either side and thus turn one organism into two, splitting them up. And so the little red ones are the new ones. The problem with doing this, of course, is that if it's carried out, you could imagine that the shells are getting smaller and smaller eventually. And so at some point, you know, they get a little too small and have to actually reproduce sexually and then make a larger shell again. But this ability to reproduce a couple different ways allows them to respond really quickly to the availability of nutrients within days to a week or two. If the nutrients are at the surface, there'll be a, a bloom, the seawater can change color, it can be visible from space, uh, can really change the local ecosystem because they're growing like mad while, they're going, while the getting is good. They're also capable of dealing with times when it's not so good to be doing photosynthesis and are capable of forming a resting state, a spore that isn't really active photosynthetically but can survive without fixing any energy from sunlight for our long periods of time. If the season is bad, if you're near the poles and it's coming into winter, of course you have to find a way to survive until the sun comes back up again in the spring. Or if the nutrients are running out, you have to find a way to survive until the nutrients come back into the surface waters again. The tendency of diatoms in particular to form blooms off the coast of California turns out to also cause some problems. Some of the species of diatoms that we get actually produce a toxin called domoic acid. And here's just a little picture of that molecule. And domoic acid is not really intended as a toxin, I don't think, by the diatoms themselves. And in fact, in low doses, it's not a big deal. However, it tends to get concentrated up food chains. And we've already talked about this in the context of mercury a little bit. The idea that as you go up from the primary producers to the primary consumers to uh, other consumers and so on and so forth, by the time you get to the top of the food chain, to organisms like tuna or swordfish or whales, you're talking about food energy that's been passed through several stages. And in fact, one kilogram of killer whale must be supported because that transfer of energy up food chains is inefficient, must be supported by many hundreds or even thousands of kilograms of plankton mass. Okay? Because it takes a lot of plankton to feed one small fish, and it takes a lot of small fish to feed one larger fish, and so on and so forth. And so if we look at sort of I think these are intended to be somewhat schematic, and I'm sorry, it's getting pulled off the screen a little bit. Um, we can actually make plots of pyramids of biomass or cell numbers in food chains in the ocean. And for instance, if we look at just biomass, how much stuff is there in each of these lifestyle categories in the ocean, by the time we get to second level 
carnivores, something like a large fish, for instance, you might have only one part in a thousand or so mass relative to the plankton that's forming the base of that food chain. And so if you have a molecule like the monic acid that doesn't tend to get digested, it doesn't tend to get broken down as far as I know, and tends to go along with the fatty parts of the organisms, it's going to get concentrated up that food chain. So even if the diatoms have only tiny concentrations of this stuff in their bodies, by the time that stuff gets concentrated into a much smaller mass of large fish, its concentration has gone up by rather a lot, enough, in fact, to change its physiographic behavior, physiological behavior to cause toxicity in the mammals that are at the top of the food chain. And so in the follow-on to diatom blooms in California, depending on what species make up those diatom blooms, it's actually, unfortunately, rather common to find uh, sea lions and pelicans and other kind of top consumers actually suffering from toxicity of demonic acid as it's been concentrated up the food chain. There are actually a couple incidents in the last few months of sea lions turning up along the shoreline in Southern California, kind of acting dazed, being in places where they're not really supposed to be because they're essentially being attacked by the toxicity of this material. An interesting thing, by the way, which I hadn't quite appreciated until I was putting together this lecture, is if you look at plankton in more detail, I think it's relatively widely believed, although I don't know how sure this is as a general statement about the ocean, but at least in some places it appears that there's more biomass actually in zooplankton than there is in phytoplankton, which is kind of bizarre. Uh, and in fact, I've written finals questions in previous years where I, the correct answer was the opposite to that. I'm afraid to say. Um, and it's kind of interesting to wonder why that might be. Why might it be that in the ocean there's actually more zooplankton than phytoplankton, at least in some parts of the ocean? Ultimately, all of the organic material in the food chain has to enter that food chain from some kind of primary producer. It all has to get there from the action of phytoplankton in the open ocean. So why aren't there more phytoplankton? How can you have more zooplankton than phytoplankton if all the organic matter is getting there from the phytoplankton? And it's kind of an inefficient process. When phytoplankton get eaten by the zooplankton, the zooplankton are expending energy to catch the phytoplankton and digest them and all that stuff. And the phytoplankton are using some of their own energy for their own purposes. So the productivity of the phytoplankton is much greater than the productivity of phytoplankton going into zooplankton, kind of by definition. So how does it happen that there are more kilograms of zooplankton in the ocean than there are phytoplankton? Can anybody maybe think of a reason why that might happen? If the flux of carbon into phytoplankton is much greater than the flux of carbon into zooplankton from the phytoplankton, how can it be that there are more kilograms of zooplankton than phytoplankton? Okay, so the phytoplankton are being consumed. That's, yeah, that's basically right. And in fact, they must be getting consumed fast. The critical difference has to be that these are being really productive, but they're really not living very long. So the carbon is going right through them really fast. It doesn't take very many phytoplankton in terms of mass to process all that carbon. Once the carbon gets into the zooplankton, it's not as much as was fixed by the phytoplankton, but it stays there longer. So zooplankton must be living longer, actually much longer, than the phytoplankton they're consuming. That's really, I think, the only way this can make sense. If the life scale, the time scale of phytoplankton is much shorter than the time scale for zooplankton. They just aren't around very long to accumulate that carbon, even though they're processing it very quickly. But I'm not sure if that's the right answer. And in fact, I didn't know any of this stuff until a couple days ago. So. Food for thought. OK. So the second major group of phytoplankton are dinoflagellates. And we haven't actually talked about these very much already um, because it turns out if you look at a, I think this is an electron microscope image of a phytoplankton organism, and they look kind of funky, actually. Those of you who are at least are sitting kind of the front, hopefully you can see that it actually kind of looks like this thing is sort of armor plates on it. 
and little seams between those plates. They are armored. They have a kind of shell, like diatoms do, but the shell is actually made out of organic material. And so it tends not to be preserved as well in sediments. So we don't really have very many sediments in the deep ocean anyway that consist of the intact bodies of these organisms because it's organic material and it tends to be consumed by decomposing organisms like bacteria before they can accumulate to make sediments. So these guys don't really play as big a role in marine sedimentation, but they're really important for photosynthesis in the ocean and they're particularly important for photosynthesis in warm water. Like diatoms, they're single-celled organisms. They tend to live singly. They tend to live apart from each other. And again, they make this cellulosic, this organic shell instead of the SiO2 shell that the diatoms do. Another distinction of the dinoflagellates from diatoms is that they actually can move around. They are capable of swimming, which might seem a little odd. These are photosynthesizing organisms in many cases, but they can swim. And let's see, hopefully I have a movie that will show you them swimming. Here we go. So this is a little microscope slide with some dinoflagellates in it, and hopefully you can see them happily swimming around actually in the slide. So dinoflagellates, we're talking about them here in the context of phytoplankton, but in fact, not all dinoflagellates are phytoplankton. Some are autotrophs, some do photosynthesis, some are heterotrophs, some eat other things, and some can do both, depending on whether it's a suitable environment for photosynthesis, whether the nutrients are available, and depending on whether or not there's an external food source that they can take advantage of. So they're kind of adaptable in that way. Dinoflagellates are particularly common in warm water and they can take advantage of nutrient-rich water. And particularly under those circumstances when water gets warm and has lots of nutrients in it, particularly in an area where there might be some nutrient-rich runoff from the land, but even naturally, there can be concentrations of them growing on those nutrients to such an extent that they actually turn the water red forming what's called a red tide. Of course, for it to really be a red tide, it has to go all the way to the shore, but we also find equivalent events happening offshore. And much like the diatoms, when they grow in high densities, they can actually create toxins that can concentrate up food chains. An interesting thing about, diatom, about dinoflagellates, excuse me, is that many types are actually capable of giving off light and this is a fairly common phenomenon in warm waters, which is occasionally observed in California. And this is a picture actually, I think from Europe, Portugal, I think. Um, and here you can see the shoreline, you can see the city lights and a radio tower. And here you can see a wave breaking and it's like glowing blue. And so it turns out that many of these organisms in particular organisms like this guy, which I showed you in the first picture, Noctiluca, will actually give off a little flash of light when they're disturbed, when they hit something, or when they find themselves in particularly turbulent water. And so there are actually stories of you know, being able to find the wake of a ship, for instance, in the dark of a moonless night, because in fact, the wake of the ship, all these organisms getting churned up behind it, if it's in the tropical ocean, actually makes this ribbon of glowing water behind them that you can use to find them with. So here's just a picture of a red tide off the coast of La Jolla. There's the Scripps Pier, I think, up here. And hopefully you can all see, it's actually kind of crimson, almost bloody colored. And this is a very concentrated bloom of dinoflagellates in the coastal ocean. And they're pretty common in Southern California, particularly during the summer when the water temperature gets up to like 20 degrees Celsius or something like that. Good swimming water is also good red tide water here. There's actually a bit of a mystery about what these organisms are doing in this water because in some cases you get blooms, perhaps not this dense, of dinoflagellates in water that doesn't actually have very many nutrients in it. When it gets warm enough in Southern California, we can actually get pretty high densities of dinoflagellates growing even though there isn't very much nutrition in the water. In some cases it appears that the dinoflagellates are actually making their own nutrients 
perhaps by fixing nitrogen. Nitrogen is one of the limiting nutrients in the surface ocean. Some of these organisms, if the temperature is right and there's enough other stuff available, may actually be able to fix nitrogen from atmospheric N2 into a useful form for their own biology. Dinoflagellate blooms in particular have some interesting repercussions. They can be so intense, there can be so much photosynthesis, so much fixation of energy into things like sugars that when the nutrients start to get exhausted and these organisms start dying and sinking to the bottom, particularly if it's relatively shallow water and it's water that's not in very good communication with the open ocean, there aren't strong currents, all of that organic material accumulating beneath the surface of the water starts to get decomposed. And of course, the process of decomposition, if it's respiration that's doing the decomposition, that's a process that consumes oxygen. And if the water is not circulating very strongly, in fact, oxygen can be consumed to the extent that it essentially disappears from the deep waters. And essentially what happens is the deep water turns into a dead zone. The oxygen can drop below a level that's critical for fish to swim, for instance, or crabs to swim along the bottom, and they just can't live there anymore. And so you can actually, going along with these blooms, and particularly in the aftermath, both because of the toxins that these organisms can generate, depending on which species, and because of just the loss of oxygen, because all of this organic material that's just been fixed by photosynthesis is starting to decompose, you can get fish kills, actually, which is kind of ironic. We have this the base of the food chain going crazy, tremendous productivity, but it's actually overwhelming the ability of higher parts of the food chain to take advantage of it, and particularly things like fish can start dying. And so this is a picture of a fish kill from a, in the bloom of a particular type of dinoflagellate, Carinia, off the coast of Florida. So basically what's happening here is either from the toxins or from just lack of oxygen, these fish can't survive, even though there's lots of food, presumably, at some form of being ready for them to eat, the oxygen's gone or there's too many toxins for them to survive. All right, the last group of phytoplankton that we're gonna focus on in some detail are the coccolithophores. These are kind of the runts, at least among the three groups that we're talking about, the smallest organisms. They can be really, really tiny only a few microns across. But in terms of numbers, they're tremendously abundant. In fact, here we have a picture uh, from space of the coast of Alaska, looking at the Alaska Peninsula here. So we're talking about an image that's you know, big. We're talking hundreds of miles, perhaps 1,000 kilometers or more from north to south here and almost as far from east to west. And in the Bering Sea, Hopefully you can see that the water has turned green, essentially. It's not that bluish color that we associate with fairly clear, uncontaminated ocean water. We're seeing the chlorophyll, in fact, removing the blue light in addition to the red light and only letting the green light come back up to the satellite. So we're actually seeing, who knows, billions, trillions of these organisms just going crazy. And they're doing it in pretty cold water, I would say considering that there's still actually some ice visible in this image. So these are very abundant organisms and they can, can occur in blooms just like the other two types. And their shells are made usually out of calcite, calcium carbonate, in these little sh shield shapes. And they're in fact some of the most prolific calcium carbonate ooze producers in the ocean. Foraminifera, which are zooplankton, can also make oozes. So they have an external shell which is made out of calcium carbonate and the individual pieces of that shell are called coccoliths, which is where the organism gets its name. And in fact, this is a really common constituent of salt, so the chalk, uh, sorry, of chalk. So the White Cliffs of Dover are in fact a big graveyard of coccoliths from quite a long time ago. Those are older fossil coccoliths, but nonetheless shows you something about how abundant they are. We're talking about cliffs hundreds of feet high that extend for many miles along the coast. Coccolithophores do relatively well in warm water, um, and they can also do relatively well in fairly deep water, so they can live fairly far below the surface and make do with relatively little light. 
That also probably gives them an advantage under other circumstances too. Um, and so they actually tend to live fairly deep relative to the other organisms. This is a little bit of a complication for this issue of trying to figure out how much productivity is happening, how much photosynthesis is occurring in the ocean by measuring how green it is. If the organism's living right up near the surface, you can see that green color very well. If it's living a little bit deeper, by the time the light gets back out again, some of that green is gonna get absorbed and it's gonna turn kind of bluish again. And it may not be quite as obvious that the photosynthesis is happening down there. So that's a correction that has to be made. When you measure the greenness of the ocean, you have to make some inference about what kind of organism is actually doing the work. All right, any questions about phytoplankton? All right, so we'll start talking a little bit about zooplankton, although there's no way we're gonna finish in 10 minutes, and that's just as well, because I didn't actually prepare the whole thing anyway. Um, and zooplankton are a component of the plankton in the ocean that make their living by eating other things. They don't make their own food. And so jellyfish would be a good example of that. Sorry for the jitteriness of the video. But there are actually many kinds of plankton and zooplankton, some of which we don't normally think of as being plankton. And you've already hopefully gone through this in your lab. In fact, I think it was a question on your quiz for the seventh lab that we can divide up the zooplankton in particular, but in fact, all plankton in the ocean, uh, according not just to their lifestyle, but how permanent that lifestyle is. So holoplankton are organisms that pretty much always stay in the planktonic community. They're drifting from birth to death. Whereas many organisms are only plankton for part of their life or even part of the time at a given stage in life. So they may start out in plankton and then become big enough that they can swim strongly and become part of the nectonic community. And there are also organisms that start out as benthic organisms and only as they become mature, actually do they go up into the water column to make their living. Jellyfish would be an example of that type, starting out benthic and eventually becoming plankton. Many fish start out plankton and eventually become nectonic. So here's a picture of a mola mola larva. It's actually the scale bar here is one millimeter. So this larva is about as big as the point of your pencil. And of course, when they get mature, they get quite a bit bigger than the people who are standing in front of them at the aquarium. Although unfortunately, I think this particular guy got released. He got so big that Monterey Bay Aquarium couldn't keep him in their tank anymore. So they had to take him out to sea and let him go because it got to be like a thousand pounds or something. It was crazy. We can divvy up zooplankton since they all make their living by eating other things. How do, how do they get that food or what kind of food do they actually get? And so there are herbivores which eat plants or eat phytoplankton. We can think of as being equivalent to that, being a primary consumer is kind of analogous to being an herbivore. There are carnivores or predators that may eat only other animals, other consumers. There are organisms that try to get goodies by filtering out dead material, filter sort of more difficult to digest material perhaps out of material, out of or organisms that have already died and are decomposing. And there are of course omnivores which eat everything or many different things. So there are big zooplankton like jellyfish, but in terms of numbers and in terms of mass, as I showed you, by far the most important are relatively small organisms. So we're gonna focus in on a few types, some of which you've already seen before. Foraminiferans, radial area, both of which are single-celled organisms and both of which contribute to marine sediments. And then ostracods and copepods, both of which are arthropods. They're actually related more or less to th organisms like shrimp or crabs. Actually, they're both crustaceans. Um, and can contribute to sediments, but don't tend to have shells that are made of durable mineral material, at least to the same volume that foraminiferans and radiolaria do. Okay. So we've already talked about foraminiferans in the context of calcareous oozes, because they make skeletons out of calcium carbonate, which can accumulate on the seafloor. And we mentioned in passing that they were zooplankton, but actually I found this cool video of a foraminiferan actually eating we're getting ready to eat. So the forum is actually living up here and 
These organisms are a little bit, you can think of them as being a little bit like an amoeba with a shell. An amoeba can kind of make projections of their bodies, single-celled bodies called pseudopods, which are a little bit like feet, to go out and grab things. And forearms actually do the same thing inside their shells. They can actually extend out these very thin pseudopods and then grab food and pull it in. And what you're seeing in this video as it loops is in fact this foram pulling in a couple of diatoms that he's about to eat. So he's, he just made his way to the salad bar and is about to eat his lunch for the day. So in general, we call forams zooplankton, but it's important to realize that like some other kinds of zooplankton, forams can kind of act as primary producers or at least can host them in a symbiotic re relationship that's a bit more complex than just eating things. And so here's a picture of a foraminiferin by Howie Spiro at UC Santa Cruz. And here's the organism itself, and here are the spines and the pseudopods. And hopefully you can see these little kind of glowing dots that are scattered all around it, a little bit like snowflakes. And those are actually photosynthesizing dinoflagellates that are living on the form. It's not like the form is in the process of eating all of these things and pulling them in like it was in the video. These dinoflagellates are actually happily living attached to the, to the forearm, and maybe the forearm is going to eat them at some point, but it's actually letting them grow. And so there's a symbiotic relationship between a zooplankton in this case and phytoplankton that are living on it as a host. And of course, the dinoflagellates are getting something one would presume from the relationship. They're kind of protected by being associated with this much bigger organism, maybe makes it more stable, their position in the water column. And if the organism, if the forearm is actually consuming other phytoplankton, it's presumably you know, releasing some of the nutrients it gets by consuming them back out into the environment and may locally enrich the water around it. So it's kind of an interesting relationship there. And it's not just, by the way, forearms that do this. It's a nice picture of a forearm that I happen to find, but in fact, radiolaria, the next group we're going to talk about, actually can also do the same thing. So I wasn't able to find any good pictures of living radiolaria, so we'll have to make do with some shells. We again talked about these organisms in the context of marine sediments because they make shells like diatoms out of SiO2 and water so they can contribute to siliceous oozes. They are single-celled zooplankton. They're also like the forams, capable of sort of grabbing food and pulling it in using pseudopods. And they can eat lots of different things. And like forams, they in fact can host symbiotic phytoplankton. So they can also live in relationships with dinoflagellates. And they make these really beautiful shells and there are lots of cool artistic pictures of them. They, these shells seem to inspire artists for some reason because of their glassy pictures. And even when they are old and have been sitting on the seafloor in marine sediments for long times, so they still actually can be quite attractive. So this is a picture of a couple of uh, radiolarian skeletons that have actually been pulled out of sediments that are something like 50 million years old. They're Eocene in age. But you can see how durable this stuff is. They're still apparently intact. All right. So the last group of organisms I'm going to talk about today that are part of the zooplankton will put off copepods, which I want to spend a little bit of time on because they're so cool. Put those off until Monday. We're going to talk about ostracods a little bit. And like copepods, and these are the two organisms in the, phyto, in the plankton community that are multicellular, but are still quite abundant in the ocean. So these are more complex and actually quite a bit larger organisms than the ones we've been talking about so far. Typically on the order of a millimeter or a fraction of a millimeter in size, they can be quite large, but the larger they are, the rarer they are in general. Unlike diatoms, these organisms are really old. In fact, they go back almost as far as any fossil that you could actually see easily with your eyes. They're some of the most ancient things in the ocean. It's clearly a design that works. They've stuck around for a long time, even though many things have happened in Earth history over that time. And here's a picture of one. They're sometimes called like a mussel shrimp or a clam shrimp, and hopefully this picture gives you a sense of where that name comes from. They are actually crustaceans, 
So biologically, they're related to crabs and shrimp and organisms like that. They have jointed limbs. But they also have the, their shell actually forms these two large cup-shaped uh, shapes that actually act almost like a clam shell and superficially can look a bit like a clam shell. But they're not mollusks. Clams are mollusks. They're not related to them at all, even though there's some superficial resemblance, particularly when the ostracod is trying to hide and has actually closed itself inside. OK. So we'll come back on Monday, and we'll finish up our discussion of plankton by talking about copepods. Yeah.